So I did some extensive research this offseason on the number 17 to see if there is any significance behind the number. Maybe civilization as we knew it was 17 seconds away from self-destruction. If we're going by numerology, the number 17 is indeed a spiritual symbol of positive change and new beginnings. Plus, where wisdom as well as skill intersect to where one can shine like a star and communicate these aspects to humanity. Honestly, this sounds just a little bit too much like astrology for numbers. Daryl Waltrip himself even seemed weary of numbers before the 1989 Daytona 500. But there was just something about the number 17 that aligned closely with the numerology of the number 17 and opened a Pandora's box full of skill and elation for Franklin, Tennessee's own Daryl Waltrip. You know, just like I know, this is a very important race. And if you're a race car driver, you want to win all the important races. Waltrip in front. I think he's going to take the gamble. It's a question of fuel. Can Waltrip hold out? NRF Productions presents the 2024 season premiere, 17, Daryl Waltrip's Day of Daytona 500 Destiny. So Daryl Waltrip entered the 1989 season looking to do what Rick Hendrick hired him to do. Be the milestone guy for Hendrick Motorsports. 1988 saw Darrell Waltrip win the Coca-Cola 600 and in Hendrick Motorsports history, he was the first to drive the trophy across the road to the Concord, North Carolina shop, an impressive feat for a championship driver. Still, there was hard work to be done as Hendrick Motorsports as an organization wasn't just seeking new mountains to climb and conquer like winning their first driver's championship. For Darrell Waltrip as a driver, Hendrick was a place to help add new accomplishments onto his impressive driver's resume. The accomplishments alone made his resume at least three pages long. He had tons of awards and accolades as a NASCAR Cup Series champion. But when Rick Hendrick flipped the pages of his resume, one big accomplishment was missing. Darrell Waltrip had been going to Daytona for 16 years trying to win the 500 with as much success as a fisherman in the desert. In his second Daytona 500 with Hendrick Motorsports, it was arguably Darrell Waltrip's to lose before he was ganged up on by the Alabama gang. Shoot, I just got a dark thought with that, but I digress because this was another way that Daryl Waltrip had lost the one race where every driver and team were on their A game. But 1989, like numerology for the number 17, brought about positive change and new beginnings. Daryl Waltrip and Jeff Hammond had gained some new wisdom from this dominant heartbreak. Randy Dorton to engine building was what Randy Orton was to WWE wrestling. His engines were capable of delivering a knockout punch like Jeff Bodine did to his competition in the 1986 running of the Daytona 500. Hendrick Motorsports was so bullish on their 1989 Daytona 500 efforts that they ran the engine with a smaller restrictor plate for preseason testing. But when the bell was ringing and their Chevrolet Monte Carlos hit the track, the gloves were off. Darrell Waltrip locked in a front row starting spot alongside his Hendrick Motorsports teammate Ken Schrader for the big race. And this was the start of the February tradition that all NASCAR fans get to experience every February, which is the Hendrick Motorsports Pole Qualifying Invitational. This year is definitely going to be Alex Bowman or Kyle Larson for the fifth year in a row, but that's what it is. It all began with 1989 pole qualifying. As for the race car, Daryl Waltrip and Jeff Hammond elected to race was the car they nicknamed Betty. Race car nicknames are a fascinating way at looking at relationships between man and machine. Dale Earnhardt Jr. nicknamed a car Amelia because his car was as strong as the daring, courageous woman that crossed the Atlantic. Now, we don't talk about what happened to Amelia Earhart, but regardless, still something impressive. And Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s race car in the 2015 and 2016 restrictor plate races was unbelievable. 
Now, obviously, there's two things that you might be thinking this car would be named after. Number one, the Betty character, the, the one with the over-exaggerated body. And number two, the Taylor Swift song. But obviously, Taylor Swift was born in 1989. So, Daryl Waltrip actually nicknamed the car Betty because of the horrible luck this car had. And the common phrase DW would say, over the radio, Betty's gone bad. The results when Daryl Waltrip drove this specific race car usually would go bad, but Jeff Hammond described this car as a really fast race car. They just needed to get the good finishes in the actual race. When it was time to race in the twin 125s, Daryl Waltrip failed the lead a lap as the pole sitter in route to an 8th place finish. A result that can be justified by the 17 team's choice of tires. Waltrip started the duel on Goodyear tires, which compared to the Hoosier tires, these tires wore out a lot faster. Daryl Waltrip needed a yellow like SpongeBob needed water. So Daryl Waltrip came down pit road, changed out the Goodyears for Hoosiers, which meant he would take the L in the twin 125s. Not the most important race, because Daryl Waltrip and the 17 team were focused on Sunday, unlike Hendrick Motorsports in the modern day, where they're more focused on qualifying, and they were going to go out from the second starting position and try to win the 1989 running of the Daytona 500. February 19th, 1989, Daryl Waltrip woke up, had his favorite breakfast, which was probably milk and cereal, cereal and milk, cereal and milk, and officially set his sights on finally winning the Daytona 500 in his 17th try. You could slice the pizza many different ways, but Daryl Waltrip's 1989 Daytona 500 was a superstition. <laughs> Everything seemed to come back to number 17, being not only Daryl Waltrip's 17th try in Daytona. He drove car number 17. He was chasing after a purse of $1.7 million, and he would have pit stall number 17 for this race. Daryl Waltrip's keys to having a good Daytona 500 in 89, by the way, 8 plus 9 equals 17, the key was pretty simple. That's just going to be the deal, to go out and run smart and uh, not make any mistakes and take care of the car and, and be there to finish and not run in those big groups. With that interview, Jeff Hammond put up the window net and it was time to go racing. This was going to be a tough 200 lap journey. The drivers were going to face a lot of physical and mental demands behind the wheel. But the potential reward at the end of the day made it all worth it. As the field rounded turn four, it was time to go racing in the 1989 Daytona 500. What do you say? One, two, three. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's go racing, boys. Darrell Waltrip would lead the first lap of the Daytona 500 and showed early that his car had speed, potentially able to check out from the field. Skirt, skirt. Before Neil Bonnet's car became like a chestnut roasting on an open fire. Toasty. And NASCAR, they thought that this was just another fan barbecuing in the infield, considering that the cars just casually decided to run a lap under green. Neil Bonnet gets out of the car and yet here comes the pack of cars just flying right by. This could have been an absolute disaster for NASCAR, but finally, after 40 seconds... And the caution will be coming out now. They've put the caution lights on around the racetrack. Uh, I can't believe what I'm seeing! Despite Chevrolet's time with the Monte Carlo reaching its end, Ford had a brand new model, the Thunderbird, for the 1989 season. NASCAR obviously doesn't want to give one manufacturer this massive advantage, so to level out the playing field, like when you're trying to level out icing on a cake, NASCAR allowed Chevrolet to put streamlined material over the headlights. 
Though it would seem irrelevant on the surface, the headlight covers made a three mile per hour difference and helped Hendrick Motorsports dominate speed weeks up to this point. Ken Schrader was hoping to be Knuff in this Daytona 500 and become the seventh driver to win the Great American Race from the pole. Dale Earnhardt had some air filter issues early in the race, and you'd think that with Dale Earnhardt's history, this is another thing that's gonna curse him, but the Intimidator was determined to overcome the only thing in racing that still sent shivers down his spine. This was Chevrolet's race to lose, with the Fords being a bit off in the 1989 Speed Weeks and again in the race. Darrell Waltrip, meanwhile, had a decent Monte Carlo, but at the moment, he was to Ken Schrader like Chase Elliott right now is to Kyle Larson, playing a sad second fiddle like Mr. Krabs in the background. Early on in the race, it was clear that the 17 was a good car, but not a great car. At times in the race, Waltrip was fading. Waltrip was fading. Fading fast like he would say in an animated movie about talking cars 28 years later. Unlike Lightning McQueen, Darrell Waltrip would not have his big crash despite nearly being collected in the big one. On lap 74, you might as well just cue the old quote about how There's millions and millions and millions of dollars of damage here. Because this crash took out a lot of good cars like Mark Martin, Dale Jarrett, Chad Little, Mickey Gibbs, and not Bill Elliott. As Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt were the favorites in this race, Darrell Waltrip was in 8th with 51 laps to go. Unlikely to outright win the Daytona 500 based on Randy Dorton's horsepower. However, there is no shortage of Daytona 500s where the fastest car didn't win the race. Look at 1979. Richard Petty was like, hey, I'm going to get third place prize money. All of a sudden, Cale Yarborough and Donnie Allison get into it on the backstretch, and now Richard Petty is the 1979 Daytona 500 champion. Heck, even for Darrell Waltrip, he had the dominant car in 1998 and still lost. Darrell Waltrip had done just about everything to lose the Daytona 500 at this point. The person that understood all the shortcomings that Daryl Waltrip had went through all the times where he wanted to sit there and eat a bag of Tide Pods after the Daytona 500 was his wife. Stevie Waltrip had two strong qualities, understanding just how Daryl Waltrip had lost the Daytona 500, but also at the time she was a mother of a 17 year old daughter, going back to the whole 17 numerology superstition. She reached aside Jeff Hammond and reiterated that they have done a million things to lose this race in the past. Now it is time to think outside the box and try to win it. So in the 1989 NASCAR Cup Series car, the fuel tanks were much larger. Many teams pushed the maximum allowable size on fuel lines, overflow tubes, and anything else needed for the fuel system, one of those teams was the Hendrick Motorsports number 17 team. According to Jeff Hammond, the 17 team pushed the maximum level allowed by NASCAR to add ounces to the fuel system's capacity. Sure, going 50 laps without fuel might be like walking through the Sahara Desert with only a canteen of water. It seemed impossible, but it was worth the shot to prove that it was possible. Darrell Waltrip was not planning to come back to the 17th pit stall for the rest of the race unless his car was on fumes. As Jeff Hammond instructed, he was going to draft anything and everything, even if there was a seagull flying down the backstretch, even as these cars didn't have the windshield wipers and some accident were to happen with that seagull, you knew that Darrell Waltrip was still going to try to get a draft off of it because it was important to save every ounce of fuel. A critical part of having this strategy work to perfection was having someone else also try to make it to the end, and this driver was Alan Kuwicki. When Alan Kuwicki was at the short tracks, he would rip open his shirt to reveal his Superman emblem. However, tracks like Daytona and Talladega were his kryptonite. However, contrary to that, this number 17 felt like this was an outside-the-box gamble that was worth a try. After all, this is a group that would later be nicknamed Underbird, so why not just give it a try? And if it doesn't work, I mean, they weren't going to get that good of a finish either way. 
This would work perfectly for Daryl Waltrip as Alan Kowicki would lead the draft and Daryl Waltrip would be right behind drafting off of him and saving more laps of fuel. However, as the race was going down to the wire, one by one, teams abandoned this strategy like a group of boys that abandoned their raft at the sight of an otter. True story, by the way. With 11 laps in the race, Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt made the stop that was supposed to win them $1.7 million. The number three pit crew helped Dale Earnhardt get the advantage over Ken Schrader after the number 25 team had an error-prone pit stop. Alan Kuwicki and Daryl Waltrip were now the two remaining drivers trying to make it 50 laps on this tank of fuel. However, how much more fuel could they save? With four laps to go, Alan Kuwicki had run every last drop of fuel. Well, evidently he's out of gas. Alan Kuwicki. Oh no! He's out of no! gas. Ran and lean. No! Down the back straightaway. He's slowing down. As Alan Kuwicki came down pit road, his race was over. So when seeing Kuwicki run out right in front of him, Daryl Waltrip was now in a state of panic comparable to Nick Sanchez when he got sucker punched. The only difference being that not only did Jeff Hammond make the situation level-headed, but also DW didn't threaten to kill him in Homestead. Without the number 7 car to draft off of, the anxieties were high for Daryl Waltrip as he took the white flag. Inside the cockpit, Waltrip could hear the popping and cracking, all the little noises, wondering if this car was going to make it to the end. But somehow, some way, Daryl Waltrip was able to minimize all those anxieties and pressures and complete those final 2.5 miles like a relief pitcher would, getting those final three outs. The Daytona 500 belongs to Franklin, Tennessee's Daryl Waltrip. He's done it. After 17 years of coming to Daytona, the driver that would drive the number 17 car and had a daughter that was 17 months old and had 17 letters in his name won the race that paid $1.7 million. And as you can see, the celebration in the 17th pit stall was legendary. The driver of the number 17 had the energy and the stamina of a five-year-old that just got a Jeff Gordon remote control car for Christmas. Thank God! It is incredible, especially today, to see a driver climb out of the car and have so much passion and emotion. You could tell how much this race and how much crossing this off his bucket list meant to Daryl Waltrip. And now the three-time NASCAR Cup Series champion from Tennessee was a Daytona 500 champion. Oh, I won the Daytona 500! I won the Daytona 500! Winning the Daytona 500 is special for any driver, but Daryl Waltrip's day of Daytona 500 destiny stands out. And to see one of NASCAR's top drivers and characters of the 1980s finally be able to add Daytona 500 on his racing resume, which he would use in 1991 when he handed over his application to NASCAR's newest owner, himself. It was incredible to see a race team win, not by speed, but on the ability to push a race car to its absolute limit. Darrell Waltrip was quoted in saying, this was a lesson in fuel economy. Remember that the next time you are frustrated with how high the gas prices are, just draft off of every car on the highway and modify your fuel system to save every ounce possible, nothing too special. On February 19, 1989, Daryl Waltrip, Jeff Hammond, and Hendrick Motorsports saw their experience and skill intersect to where they shined like a star on NASCAR's biggest stage, ending not only in DW having a celebration for the ages, skirt, 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 skirt but showing that there's a lot of magic when you roll up to the grid in a NASCAR Cup Series race with the number 17 on your side door. So if you guys enjoyed this video, this is just the start as there are going to be plenty of different topics and stories that NRF Productions is going to cover in this 2024 season. Other than that, this is Nathan for Digital Gas House, Life's a Beach, and then you drive.